Compared to non-vegetarians, those removing meat from their diets tend to have healthier body weights, cholesterol, blood sugars, and blood pressures, with a lower mortality rate due to ischemic heart disease, the number one killer of men and women. However, underestimating the importance of correct supplementation of vitamin B12 can nullify these benefits. Currently, the official position of associations and governmental agencies is categorical and unequivocal. In the case of a vegetarian diet, even if you eat eggs and dairy, in fact, I would extend that to flexitarians eating a few servings of meat a week, supplementation of vitamin B12 is required. Now, it's not just those eating plant-based that should be concerned about getting enough B12. About one in three non-vegetarians aren't getting enough for optimal health, and that may exceed half in women, especially when they're pregnant. Uh, but this number could run as high as nearly 9 out of 10 among those eating strictly plant-based, and 10 out of 10 doing it long-term. There are three groups of people who should ensure they have a regular, reliable source of vitamin B12 by supplementing their diet with vitamin B12 fortified foods or vitamin B12 supplements. Those who've had bariatric surgery, uh, which can sometimes impair absorption, those eating plant-based diets, and the more than 100 million Americans older than age 50. Why can't you get regularly tested for signs of functional B12 deficiency, like getting your homocysteine or methylonic acid level tested? Though those are nearly always elevated in cases of B12 deficiency, there are rare cases of severe B12 deficiency manifesting with normal B12 levels in the blood, normal MMA levels, and normal homocysteine. How do we know it was B12 deficiency? Because within months of B12 treatment, they made a remarkable recovery. So best to just take it and not wait for symptoms to arise. The question is how much and how often. Some recommend a single dose of 50 to 100 micrograms a day, or 1,000 micrograms twice a week. Others suggest 50 to 150 a day. Some even recommend 500 micrograms a day. It all depends on the target levels you want in your body. Uh, for those with normal absorption capacity, meaning being under age 50, with an intact gastrointestinal system, and without diseases like pernicious anemia, we normally lose about 1 microgram of vitamin B12 a day. So that's how much we have to replace, on average, every day. So why is the recommended daily allowance 2.4 micrograms a day? Well, we only absorb about half of tiny doses of uh, B12 we get in our diet. So by eating 2.4, we can make sure we absorb the 1 microgram into our body to replace the 1 microgram we're losing every day. Taking larger doses, like in supplement form, an even smaller fraction is absorbed. So it might take a single oral dose of 10 micrograms to get that 1 microgram absorption but just 10 a day failed to sufficiently lower homocysteine levels to under 10 even after a year, so maybe we need to absorb more than that 1.6 micrograms every day for optimal health. The current RDA is primarily based on a 1958 study that just looked at a small number of patients and only measured their blood counts. Absorbing 1 microgram a day may be enough to maintain blood cell production, but it may not be sufficient for all the other things that vitamin B12 does. In 2019, a study found an association between high intakes of vitamins B6 and B12 from food and supplements with the risk of hip fracture among postmenopausal women in the Harvard Nurses Health Study. Uh, but note it was only the combined high intake of vitamins B6 and B12. Uh, we know that treatment with high doses of vitamin B6 may alone increase hip fracture risk. After a decade or so, uh, those who had been taking high-dose B6 supplements had about 40% higher hip fracture risk, but not in those taking B12. And that's what the Harvard study found, too. High intake of vitamin B12 alone was not associated with increased risk. In fact, some observational studies suggest slightly lower fracture risk at high uh, B12 blood levels, uh, but what we care about most are interventional studies where people are randomized to B12 so we can see what happens. And when you do that, no increased fracture risk among those given B12. In conclusion, based on randomized controlled trials, high doses of vitamin B12 have not been shown to be associated with the risk of fractures. OK, but what about this? In 2017, a study found that men taking vitamin B12 supplements appeared to have an 
increase in lung cancer risk. Now, they didn't find any such association in women. It was mostly among smoking men. I mean, could it be that you know, B12 is like feeding some budding tumors? I mean, it's hard to imagine a, a vitamin being carcinogenic on its own, and especially somehow only in men, not women. The bottom line is that replication of these findings with additional studies is necessary, and indeed, when you put all the observational studies together, there was no significant correlation between the levels of B12 in the blood and lung cancer, whether you smoked or not. I mean, if anything, most studies seem to be trending towards higher B12 levels being protected. Who has higher levels of B12 circulating in their blood? Those who eat lots of meat and dairy. In fact, probably the most important contributors. And those who eat more meat do tend to have more lung cancer, about 35% more risk for every about uh, daily quarter-pound burger, and 20% increased risk for each like, you know, breakfast sausage leg. So no wonder those with higher B12 levels in their blood could have more lung cancer. The B12 could just be a marker for meat intake. Instead of high B12 blood levels leading to cancer, I mean, maybe cancer leads to high blood levels, and indeed nearly three-quarters of cancer patients exhibit elevated B12 levels. Uh, so elevated B12 levels may just be a marker for cancer. Um, there's all sorts of things beyond just taking extra B12 that can raise your levels, liver problems, kidney problems, bone marrow problems, and cancer. So high levels may just be a, a marker of a brewing not yet diagnosed cancer. Based on the data of several vitamin B12 status biomarker studies, maybe the recommended intake for most adults should be raised to more like 4, uh, which is what you see, for example, in Europe, uh, suggesting they want people to absorb at least 2 into their body every day. In that case, you'd need to take more than 50 a day. And now we have data suggesting getting 7 a day may be even better. So if you wanted to absorb 3.5 micrograms, half of the intake that may optimize functional B12 status, how much would you need to take in a single daily dose? U stands for uptake, uh, absorption into your body, and D is your single daily dose. To absorb 3.5, you theoretically need to take a single daily dose of about uh, 225, which I round in my recommendations to 250 a day. Now that's just one of three methods you can use. That you can use a simpler and cheaper way is to take a single dose a week. If you want 3.5 in a day, uh, then you'd want to get at least 24.5 in you in a week. And to get that in a single dose, you'd have to theoretically uh, take about 2,600, which I rounded my recommendations to 2,500. Okay, but that's theoretical. Maybe you need even more. 